point for the quantum 1D XX pin chain and the Bessel kernel. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to visit this very nice place and uh, to give a talk here. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, spin current for quantum one-dimensional XX spin chain and its connection to Bessel kernel. So apparently, uh, my talk is related to random matrix theory because of this Bessel kernel is kind of well-known object in random matrix theory, but the subject of this kind of, this, this is kind of somewhat related to kind of non-equilibrium properties of one-dimensional quantum system. This may not be so familiar to you, so maybe I start from the beginning. And in fact, uh, my talk is based on this uh, paper already, which was already put on the archive. And in fact, this was already published in Journal of Statistical Mechanics. So if you are interested in, uh, you can take a closer look. Right. So, first, maybe, first I can describe kind of roughly what kind of uh, setup and the model and the quantity we are considering. So, we, the quantity we are interested in is the statistics of the integrated current of up spins at position alpha, which means that uh, we count the, num the, the number of up spins which crossed from this place to this place between time zero and t. And the dynamics of this system is described by the famous Schrodinger equation for the so-called XX spin chain, quantum spin chain. And uh, the initial condition is taken to be the so-called domain wall initial condition. So the Hamiltonian of this quantum XX spin chain is written down here. And uh, the quantity of our interest, this integrated current, which is equivalent to count the, counting the number of up spins from the position alpha to the, left, to the right, which is written in this way in uh, operator form. So basically, this is the model and the quantity we're interested in. If you understand this, then maybe you can skip the next few, few slides. But uh, for those who are not so <laughs> familiar with this kind of subject, let me try to explain more on this first. <coughs> yes, so yeah, maybe one question. Yeah, yes? Yeah, yeah, I will explain. So if you are, yeah, <laughs> this is, yeah, the next few slides are really for such kind of purpose. Yeah, so, yeah, one, one question. Are you physicist or mathematician? Physicist? Uh, almost no, uh, some physicists, yes. So probably physicists know better about quantum mechanics. But it, I expect that, that there are especially with some probabilists who don't know, almost, who know almost nothing about quantum mechanics. So let me really start from the beginning. So yeah, I, in, in, in fact, uh, myself, I, I myself has been working on probability, probabilistic models for a long time. But uh, so this time my talk is about quantum mechanics. So let me try to explain a little bit. Uh, <coughs> of course, you should know that there are some quantum systems, right? Which describes uh, evolution of atoms and molecular, molecules and so on. And the time of evolution of such quantum system is known to be described by the famous Schrodinger equation, which can be written in this way. So here, so for simplicity, maybe we, at least in this in the next few slides, we only consider a finite dimensional case. And for the case of a finite dimensional state, state space, describing quantum state, this H is just a Hamiltonian matrix. So this is called the Hamiltonian. And the Psi, so this is called kind of Ket vector. So this is the famous uh, notorious Dirac notation. And this is the M vector corresponding to this uh, finite dimensional state space. And then, so this can be considered as kind of time, time evolution of vector, M vector, using this Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian matrix, right? <clears throat> and uh, yeah, this vector represents a quantum state. And uh, we are interested in some physical quantities, which is represented by a Hamiltonian matrix, say A matrix. And its average at time t is 
kind of defined to be this object. So this is a column vector. This is Hamishan matrix. This is a row vector with, with uh, sorry, with uh, uh, transpose and complex conjugate. So this is now number. And this is denoted by this bracket, A of T. Right? So this is the kind of average value for the physical quantity A at time T. Right? And yeah, uh, sorry, so this psi, psi of T ket is a state at time T, which is according to the Schrodinger equation given by this, when H is just constant. And uh, so this is a kind of dual for this psi, uh, psi ket. And this can be written in a slightly different way by using this kind of uh, definition in this way. So in this way, in this representation, we are thinking that A is kind of constant, does not depend on T, but the state, psi, depends on T. But uh, by using, by doing simple calculation using this, then this can be rewritten in this way, in which psi is kind of constant, does not depend on T, but this A, physical quantity depends on T, where A of T is defined in this way. So this is uh, related to the so-called uh, Schrodinger picture and Heisenberg picture. Question? H, yeah, for, for the moment, yeah, in this, in this uh, at least in this talk, we only consider, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, we can consider some time-dependent situation, and then yeah, these formulas uh, become more complicated. But uh, at least in this talk, uh, we consider a constant matrix Hamiltonian H, right? So, so this is the quantity we are interested in, <coughs> in quantum mechanics. But uh, if you are fam more familiar with uh, stochastic processes, maybe one can compare this formalism with uh, more familiar stochastic processes. <laughs> Uh, of course, time evolution, for, for, for example, for Markov process is described by Kolmogorov equation. In the four other case, this can be written in this way. And L, L is the usual generator, and L psi is the adjoint for forward equation. Of course, uh, if you compare this uh, familiar Kolmogorov equation with the Schrodinger equation, this is almost the same, at least formally. If you, so th that, of course, the big difference, the main difference is just uh, in, if we consider this as a kind of real time, this is imaginary time. We, we should put just I for T. <coughs> so in that sense, they are very, very similar. So from algebraic and uh, for, formal point of view, there are many similarities, and one can do many similar calculations and so on. But if, we, if it comes to calculating some physical quantity, especially average, then there's a big difference, in fact between quantum mechanics and uh, stochastic uh, Markov process in particular, because in the case of Markov process, the average is, of course, de defined to be the expectation, which is defined to be this way, right? And P is here, evolving according to this Kolmogorov Kolmog equation, and the average, so this expectation, is linear in P. Whereas in the quantum case, so this average, quantum average, is quadratic in Psi. Right, and this is at this level. This is just a formal, and the, the difference seems to be just a little, little bit. Maybe you think, but uh, in fact, this technically, this difference makes a huge uh, difference. So there are many things one can do for stochastic processes, and if when I when we want to try to kind of do similar calculation for stochastic case, this difference between the definition of averages uh, give us uh, sometimes he headaches how to proceed. Anyway, <coughs> so this is the kind of explanation about the basics about quantum dynamics. And then comes the notation. Uh, we, we, we are interested in particular quantum spin chain called XX spin chain. And uh, maybe first we should introduce notation for two by two matrices, so-called Pauli matrices, sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z. So these are two by two matrices defined in this way. And uh, sometimes it is useful to introduce half of them called the spin matrices, where i is x, y, z. And we also introduce vector, which is denoted by the ket again, uh, corresponding to the up spin, which is represented by one zero, and down spin correspond, 
represented by 0, 1. So we are considering two-dimensional vector space. And these are the vec uh, basis vectors, and these are some matrices. And the Hamiltonian for the XX spin chain, which appeared already in the first slide, is, was written in this way. And J is controlling the strength of the interaction among spins, neighboring spins. And this is called coupling constant in physics. And the subscript, subscript N here for N means that uh, this, this should be considered as a matrix of huge size, which acts non-trivially only on the space corresponding to the site N, the position N, but uh, acts trivially as an identity matrix to other sites, to spaces related to other sites, right? So, so this is basically a tensor product for matrices. So S and Z can be considered as a tensor product of unit, unit matrices for the sites J less than N, and uh, on the site N, this acts as a SZ, one half of this, and then for the remaining, again, acts as an identity matrix. Okay, some question? And then, uh, the initial condition can be represented as some vector, maybe in this, with this notation. So this means that uh, we have up spins to, to the left from the origin. Uh, we have only down spins to the right of the origin, at the initially. And this should be also considered as a tensor product of vectors, right? And this we denote by dw, because this is called domain wall initial condition. And the probability that the total number of transported spins at time, uh, between time zero and t, at the positions uh, alpha, may be defined to be this, this sum. So this means that, uh, so, so this is the initial state, domain wall initial state. So this is the time evolution. So this is the quantum state at time t. Then we do kind of measurement, which means that we count, we look at the configurations uh, of quantum state at time t in, in, the, in the basis of SC, whether this has up spins or down spins at the position M. And so this is uh, one part, and this is the kind of dual part, and then we consider this quantity and take a sum of a states, general states with which satisfies this condition. So this, so S, Z, o, Z, M is basically just one half or um, plus minus one half. And uh, this means that uh, we take us, so this contributes non-trivial only when S, M, Z is plus one half, right? And in this case, this contributes to, to one. And then we consider uh, the sum of all, all of these <laughs> quantities. And then this should be the number of up spins from the position alpha to the right. And we only take a sum of uh, such configurations which, in which this total sum is given by small n. So this can be interpreted as the probability that the total spin, up spins, uh, which which transported at position alpha between time zero and t is given by n. So this is the kind of quantum mechanical interpretation of probability. Okay. Right, and I hope you understood. And then, uh, the, once we have a probability, kind of diff some formula for the probability, of course one can diff introduce a moment generative function by using this probability in this way. And this is denoted by this, or maybe chi of lambda t. And if, if at this point, there are kind of two notations for this bracket. One is from this uh, moment generative function, uh, the other from quantum average. But in fact, they are equivalent, consistent, because uh, we have this kind of identity as well. Anyway, so, so this is the quantity we're interested in, the average, uh, sorry, uh, moment generative function of NT. So this is the quantity we are actually interested in, in this talk. Uh, everything clear? Model, quantity, 
long. Okay, good. Right, and uh, one small remark is that uh, even though we defined n of t in a, by using operator or by using some probability distribution, this can be considered as an integrated current in the following sense. We can, by using the, time, the Schrodinger equation, one can write down the time, time evolution for time dependent uh, operator S alpha z, and this can be calculated in this way, and this can be written in this way, where j alpha is given by this expression, and this can be considered as kind of instantaneous current in operator form, and uh, <coughs> then we can rewrite this quantity integrated current which was defined to be this object by using this instantaneous current in this way. So in, yeah, in this way, this can be considered, really considered as integrated current. This is a remark. And uh, our main result, my kind of theorem in this talk is an explicit formula for this quantity. So this generative function for the integrated current. And we, we found out that uh, this quantity can be written as a single Fredholm determinant. Uh, with the Bessel kernel, which is uh, given by this one, by this expression. So this is uh, the usual well-known continuous Bessel kernel. And uh, this, as some of, you, some of you probably probably know, this Bessel kernel is well known to describe the statistics of eigenvalues at the spectrum edge, especially at the so-called hard edge, not soft edge. <coughs> and uh, yeah. And by, because there are many things which have been known for this Bessel kernel, once we have this formula, we can study various properties of this spin current for XX spin chain. And for example, we could calculate the large deviation, which was our main motivation. <coughs> right, so yeah, so then let me try to explain what kind of large deviation we see for this spin current. But before that, this is a really basic. So large division already appeared in, in the morning, and uh, he, he said that uh, this large division should be quite well known here. But still, let me try to start from the basics. So maybe to compare, it is useful to recall the very, very basic stuff. So this is a large division for random walk, single random walk, very, very single. No random environment, so on. So let psi i be IID Bernoulli random variables. So this takes values one or one minus one uh, with e equal pro probability one half. And we introduce random variable xn to be just a sum of psi one, blah, 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 psi n. So this can be considered as a position of a random walker at time n. And uh, it is easy to calculate the average and variance to be zero and n, right? So this is really standard, and from this, we see that the typical fluctuation of this position of random walker is on the scale of a square root of n, and uh, as you know from the central limit theorem, the distribution at this scale is simply given by Gaussian, which is depicted here. But maybe we could be interested in large deviation at the scale of n, then we consider the probability that xn is equal to ny, which should be very, very small, and this decays like e to the power minus something n, and this something is, which is denoted by phi of y here, so this is the rate function, or a large deviation function, and in this particular case of this, this simple random walker, this can be calculated explicitly, and uh, so this is given by this binary entropy function, which is also depicted here. In a sense, what we, we are interested in is to find something like phi of y for our problem of xx spin chain integrated current, right? Yeah, so coming back to our problem for, of spin current for xx spin chain, <coughs> so average and variance had been known. So let's record that. So about the average, in 1999, so these people succeeded in calculating the average and uh, for large t, they observed, they saw that uh, this behaves like, this grows like t over pi. So this grows linearly, average grows linearly, and the coefficient is one over pi. So this was their result. And almost 10 years later, these people, some of them are coming from here, so they succeeded in calculating the variance, 
and they found that uh, this, for large t, this behaves like this. So basically, so this variance grows like log logarithm of t with coefficient one over two pi squared, and they could also calculate the next order, which is constant, and this, they could find some formula as a sum of a few different integrals, and the numerically, they, they could give, calculate the numerical value to be given by 2.96, blah, blah, blah. So this was the situation. Then, so our result is about a large deviation for the, this quantity. <coughs> uh, for the moment, we are uh, focusing only to the case of alpha equals zero, which corresponds to the current at the origin. And then for this particular case, uh, the large deviation at the scale of t right, is given by a, b, uh, this expression. So this decays like e to the power minus t squared and some function psi of a. So in many cases, this scale is t, but uh, somehow in this case, uh, we see t squared behavior. And uh, also, we could calculate this late function, large division function, psi of a, explicitly. So this comes uh, immediate, uh, uh, just, just now. So to describe the results for psi of a, we let's recall the definitions of complete in elliptic integrals of the first and second kind, so denoted by k and e. So these are given by this. In terms of this, oh, sorry, we found that uh, the rate function, psi of a, which describes the decay of the probability for our xx spin current is given by some parametric form which using a function f of r and a of r, uh, where f of r is given this way and a of r is given in this way. So a of r depends on the value of r. So when r is between zero, 0 and 1, this is given by this expression. And when r is bigger than 1, this is given by this expression. And using also this function a of r, f of r is given in this way, again using k and e. And uh, yeah, so one can check that a of r is a monotonically increasing function. So there should be inverse. So, so this, this, is, this is denoted by r of a, which appears here. So by combining this, Psi can be considered as a function of A, right? Yeah, so this is a kind of basic result in, in my talk, but uh, I have to say that for the moment, uh, to, to get this formula, the arguments are, st are the, in, 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 argument, in our arguments, there are still, there's still one unjustified change of limits. So in that sense, this cannot be, this is not really a theorem yet. But uh, yeah, so this is, a, I think, yeah. <laughs> That should that be correct, I think, but uh, yeah, there's no proof yet. So this is uh, so because we have explicit formula for functions a, uh, the f, and also psi, we can draw their figures easily. F of r looks like this, and a of r looks like this, and by combining this, we can draw a figure for large deviation function psi of a as a function of a. So this is given by this. And in fact, we could also, because this is coming from quantum evolution, quantum non-equilibrium problem, we tried to kind of simulate the quantum dynamics by using so-called DMRG method. So this is rather easy now. You can just go to some website and download some program to simulate the quantum dynamics and then try to calculate such quantity. And this is what we did. And compared with a theoretical prediction, and as you see, uh, so the agreement was pretty, very, very good, I think. So green curve is from our theoretical prediction. And this plus, purple, purple plus pluses are from DMRG numerical calculations. So they are agreeing very well, even though this time is only at eight. Of course, the large deviation is expected to hold when T become, becomes very, very large, but even for Relatively small time, t equal eight, so agreement is like this. Very good, I think. Yes. Okay. So this is a kind of main messages I wanted to convey. But in the remaining time, let me try to explain how we could arrive at that formulas. 
So first, uh, there is a kind of standard mapping from this XX spin chain to free fermion problem. So this is what we do first. So, so the model itself was described in terms of spin of variables, but there is a very nice mapping from spin variables to fermions, so-called jordan Wigner transformation, which is given here. So this is a non-local transformation, but uh, by using commutation relations of spins, one can check that uh, this CJ and CJ dagger satisfy the so-called canonical anti-commutation relation, which is given here. And uh, so this means that uh, this CJ, CJ daggers defined in terms of these spin variables can be considered as fermions. And in terms of these fermions, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian and the quantity and so on in this fermion language. And the Hamiltonian of XX spin chain can be written in terms of the fermions like, like this. And this is now kind of quadratic in C, C operators, which means that uh, this is so-called free fermions. So one can diagonalize this Hamiltonian in a standard way and so on. Right? And the domain of initial condition can be also written in terms of these fermions where zero means the vector which has no fermions. And our integrated current can be also written in terms of these fermions in this way. So all things uh, in, can be written in terms of fermions now. Right, and in fact, uh, at the beginning, we didn't know anything, but um, after searching for a while, we noticed that in fact, by using kind of standard machinery of this free fermion, one can write down some determinant of formula already for our quantity. And this was done by Iceland Lux already several years back. And they found a formula for our quantity in terms of determinant. In this case, they found a formula in terms of, of the so-called discrete Bessel kernel. And the kernel is given here. Again, in terms of best function, but uh, here is a sum, not integral, as in the continuous best curve. Anyway, there was a formula like this. One remark here would be that uh, this same kernel, the discrete best kernel, also appeared in the analysis of surface growth, the so-called polynuclear growth model, PNG model, which is known to be in the KPZ class. And, uh, so, so first, we thought that maybe we can simply use this to study large deviation, but uh, for the moment, we don't know how to do it. So it, for the moment, it seems that uh, this expression is not so suitable for asymptotic, for getting some expression for large deviation for large D. But maybe there are some experts who can do it. If you can think of it, please let me know. But uh, for us, uh, so it took some time to proceed, but uh, at some point we noticed that uh, in fact there's an uh, interesting identity between the Fredholm determinant in terms of the discrete Bessel kernel, which was found by Ayers and Lux, and the Fredholm determinant in terms of the continuous Bessel kernel, which is which describes the H statistic H statistics of random matrix theory, right? Uh, yeah. Um, once we have this identity, then the problem of spin current for XX spin chain can be just mapped to the problem of uh, Bessel kernel, the continuous Bessel kernel. And as, you, as some of you may know, Bessel kernel also appears in the large N limit of Wishart matrix, so maybe one can use this fact. And the trace of this identity was not so difficult once you expect this, 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 was, this can be done just by comparing the traces in the expansion of, of Fredholm determinant. Even though the calculations are not completely trivial, it's not too difficult either. And anyway, w once we have this formula, then so combining the result by Iceland Lux and this identity, then we can, we can arrive at our main theorem. Right. Uh, yeah, but still, so one remark is that uh, as, uh, as I, as I said, so this continuous Bessel kernel is very, very well known from the work by Tracy and Widom in 1994. And this discrete Bessel kernel is also pretty well known, which appeared in PNG uh, around 2000, the year 2000, I think. But uh, this identity has not been known 
after, yeah, for 20 years or so. So, so it was a bit surprising. Um, that if you have some reference which already explained this, please let me know. So when I finished this paper, I sent an email to Peter Forrester, which is the kind of, <laughs> kind of best expert, I, th I thought, to ask this kind of question. And then he said he didn't know it. Even though he know, he, uh, uh, by after looking at this identity, he immediately checked his book and so on. He know, uh, and he let me know that uh, by combining this formula and this formula, at least z equal z, z equal one case of this identity can be understood rather easy. But uh, at least uh, in this way, this this identity has not been written down. Yes. So this depends on alpha here. But all the integer part. So this sum is so there is a sum for for, for example if you expand this there is a sum of uh, yes. Ah no, of course uh, this. Mm. Yes, yeah, so, uh, sorry, so this, this alpha has to be integer, that's right. Yes. Yeah, that's right, yeah, sorry, yeah. F only for the case where, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Okay, anyway, once we have this formula, then there's, there are a few remarks, maybe. So one, the first one is that uh, we can consider lambda goes to minus infinity limit. So in this case, so this generating function becomes just a probability that n of t is equal to zero, which means that uh, the system, starting from the domain world, condition, domain world initial condition, has to come back to the real original initial condition, which is the domain world initial condition. And so this can be written in this way. And uh, because of this interpretation, this, so th and this can be considered as a probability, and uh, this is known as a return probability, or a Loschmidt echo in quantum dynamical context. And uh, so this return probability is kind of easy, a little bit easier to handle. And this was already calculated by some people exactly to be given by e to the minus t squared over four for any finite t. <laughs> and this suggests that uh, our rate function at a equals zero at the left edge should be given by one quarter. So this will be, this can be checked by our formula. And one more thing, uh, because of the connection to Bessel kernel, maybe we can look at a famous paper by Tracy and Widom on Bessel kernel. And uh, in that paper, they did some asymptotics uh, uh, for this region. And uh, this seems to suggest that uh, the, rate, the derivative of our rate function at a equals zero should be given by minus two. And this can be also checked in our formula. Right, so in the remaining, uh, I have 10 minutes, right? I will try to explain how we could get the formula for the large deviation. So first, we go to the Wishart matrix, which is a kind of generalization of GUE matrix, which appeared in the lectures in the morning. So this is, uh, so first let's consider mat random matrix X, which is M by N. Gaussian matrix whose elements are complex and basically IID, as in the case of GUE. But then let's consider n by n matrix now, which is denoted by W, which is constituted in terms of X in this way. So this is called the Wishart matrix. And this is n by n. And uh, as in the case of GUE, the joint eigenvalue probability density function can be also written like explicitly. And this is given by this formula. So this is a square of Van der Mond determinant. So this is also very, very similar to the case of GUE. But uh, in the case of GUE, we have Gaussian here. But uh, this is now, uh, for the Richard matrix, this, this is replaced by this xi to the power something and e to the power minus x. But this has very, very similar property to GUE. Right? And uh, because of this, if you put, put this on the exponent, this can be considered as coming from Kuro interaction. So this is also sometimes called, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So this is interpretation. Right, 
anyway, and the correlation functions of uh, Wisher's matrix, we also see something similar for GUE in this morning. Um, there's a similar formula for the kernel, which describes the correlations of eigenvalues of Wishart matrix, which is written in this way. Uh, so this morning for GUE, we, we had Hamilton polynomials, but for Wishart matrix, we have to use Laguerre polynomials. But they are pretty similar, and one can also consider large n limit, and especially at hard edge case, in which we consider x close to zero, then for this particular scaling, we get this continuous basic kernel. And if we compare these formulas, one can see that if we consider the interval of this Wishart matrix from zero to t squared over four n squared, and if we take n goes to infinity limit, then this corresponds to our quantity of xx current between time zero and t. Anyway, so now we, our problem can be, was mapped to a kind of problem of a Wishart matrix. And we are interested in large deviation for Wishart matrix. And this kind of problem has been considered by several groups. In physics literature, for example, Majunda and the group. And there are also other works, and I think uh, we also worked on this kind of issue, problem. And anyway, so there are some explicit formulas for large deviation function for Wishart matrix. Uh, for example, uh, the number of eigenvalues in the given interval i satisfies the large deviation property of this form. So, so, so this probability, again, decays very fast. And the decay is given in this way, e to the power minus t n squared. And uh, this is the rate function for, for this Wishart matrix uh, large deviation. And n is, n is size of matrix, yes. Hmm? N large is size of matrix. That's right, yes, for Wishart matrix, yes. <laughs> and this. Rate function can be considered, can be calculated by so called Coulomb gas method. And rho star is the most prob probable density with the condition that the number of eigenvalues are in, in i is given by some certain number. And of course, this should satisfy this normalization con uh, this condition. And if we introduce the resolvent in this way, then the rate function can be described. So here I'm just borrowing some results from previous papers. So I'm not explaining how we can arrive at this point. But there's also a constraint coming from the number of eigenvalues in a given interval i. Anyway, by using these formulas, and uh, <coughs> we can arrive at the formula for the rate function for our problem. Uh, <coughs> we from some calculation, we expect that uh, this lambda minus, which appears as a description of this large division function, should have some scale like t squared over n squared. And we introduce some parameter r here, which appeared in the description of large division function. Anyway, <coughs> and for the case of this interval, we can see that this rate function for Wishart matrix behaves in this way for large n. And here is some kind of exchange of limits. So now, so this formula was found for large n, but uh, we want to go to large t, right? And here, th this is this limit. The change of limit has not been uh, completely well understood yet. But uh, assuming that uh, this limit can be exchanged, then we, from this formula, we can find a rate function for our problem of x expansion. And this is uh, what what I showed you almost at the beginning. Right, and once we have a formula for the rate function, for example, one can, const one can check that the most probable, probable point is given by t over pi. So this is not so difficult. And uh, one can also do kind of expansion around that most probable point, one, one over pi, a equal one over pi, to see kind of small fluctuations. And we can see that uh, this is given by Gaussian. And uh, the, the variance is given by log t, basically. So this was also uh, obtained in a previous work, as I mentioned. <laughs> so the way we do is that uh, using explicit formula for the rate function, we try to do some small delta r calculation. And we, see th we get this kind of formula and this kind of formula. And then combining them, we see that uh, this rate function uh, multiplied by t squared behaves like 
this one. So n is the number of eigenvalues. So, and of course, we should put this uh, on the shoulder of exponential, right? So this is basically probability, and this behaves like this. And uh, so because this e to the power minus something delta n squared, this is Gaussian, and the variance is given by basically log t divided by 2 pi squared. And uh, this is consistent with the previous result for the variance. And because now we have better formula in terms of Fred determinant using continuous Bessel kernel, we could also do a little more uh, about the variance. And we could check that uh, so this can be, for, uh, still for large t, this is given by log t divided by 2 pi squared plus constant. And now, in this way, we could see that, in fact, the constant is very, very easy. And it, can, it, it is given, simply given by log 2 log 2 plus gamma plus 1, where gamma is, of course, uh, Euler's constant. Right, so this is basically what I wanted to say. So to summarize, so in this talk, we consider integrated spin current for particular simple model of quantum XX spin chain. And the initial condition was taken to the very, very special one, the domain wall initial condition. And uh, basically, in this talk, our main result, our main theorem, was an explicit fo determinant of formula for the generative function in terms of the Bessel kernel. But the uh, kind of main motivation and the kind, kind of main result in this talk was that uh, we could also calculate a large dimension function explicitly by doing asymptotics for this formula. And then it was written in terms of the com uh, complete elliptic integrals. But uh, yeah, so complete free is not that giving you, yeah. We have to consider the change of limit more carefully. And the, 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 uh, our main observation is the equivalence between discrete Bessel kernel and the continuous Bessel kernel. And uh, this is, yeah, coming from some calculation, but uh, I think we haven't completely understand what, how general the, for, the correspondence is, and that would be very interesting, I think. And of course, uh, our model is very special. The quantity was very special, and so on. So I think uh, there should be various generalizations of this work. Okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>